So. So, hi, hello, uh, everybody. Welcome to this um, session uh, dedicated to analyze the uh, the problems when. Uh, sorry. That's okay. Welcome to this session dedicated to analyze some some problems when uh, it is necessary to access services uh, with a, a mobile uh, access. Let's uh, introduce our first speaker. Is uh, Dir Kutze. Uh, he is a senior uh, researcher in the Center for Computing Technologies at the University of Bremen. So, thank you, Esther. Is it on? Can you hear me? Sorry? Is it on? Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for the introduction, Esther. Um, so. Um, to many of us who are working in uh, networks and mobile communication, it's not really new that um, the traditional model um, of um, supplying users with uh, fixed capabilities, uh, handsets that can only be used in pre-configured networks like GSM, for example, that's, that does not longer hold. We have uh, now a different, uh, a huge, uh, selection of networks, like wireless LAN, we have UMTS, we have uh, WiMAX, wireless broadband, and whatever. So they have partly overlapping service areas, they have competing tariffing schemes, and, and, um, and so on. And, but there's currently not really a solution that enables the user to uh, select the most appropriate service at a given time, so depending on context, like position, uh, intended application usage, uh, and so on. And this talk is about a, a network information service um, that is um, intended to distribute information about network services, uh, services like access information, but also higher layer services like voice over IP information or uh, media on demand uh, and things like that. Um, so there has been a talk at, the, at last year's uh, Tirina conference about the basic concepts um, of this uh, approach. And so this talk and, and the full paper that's uh, in the core system uh, is more focused on operational issues, how to get this really working in a large scale, and uh, about our experiences uh, doing so. OK, we are a bit focusing now on the wireless NAN scenario. So there's a clear tr um, uh, uh, there's an, ob an observation that service lo um, location and selection is a major issue for wireless uh, LAN service providers. So there are different use cases that you can actually um, see from the, the uh, tools that they are, they are trying to provide you with. So there's information about general co coverage, roaming uh, possibilities, tariffing schemes. Some tools are intending, intending to, to facilitate uh, automated access. Um, and also there is, uh, the, uh, for specific scenarios like campus networks, uh, there's the use case of providing information for diagnosis and maintenance. Um, unfortunately, um, the existing ways for service location and selection are rather insufficient for mobile users. So currently, with mainly the situation that each provider has its own tool set, its, its own infrastructure, and is mainly distributing information about their own network, so T-Mobile as an example. And many tools are really not adequate for mobile usage. So we have really ancient systems like uh, displays uh, at airport launches and whatever. We have web-based information services. We have uh, Google Maps-based mess apps. Um, they're quite interesting to, to look at, but they're not really helpful when you are a portable device that is trying to automatically associate to a network because in that scenario you, you often you, you don't have the access you cannot look at the Google Mesh Google Maps net mesh up and so it doesn't really help you also the information is quite often uh, outdated a particular example is the phone community wireless LAN approach so uh, phone um, is based on giving away access points uh, to, to members of their community and they are operating them, and so they, they are, one of their tasks is actually to, to show potential users the availability of, of services. 
And so phone has developed different tools for that. And so a Google Maps based tool just for, for looking at uh, geographical um, areas, where are hotspots, which ones are active, and so on. Um, however, this is mainly informational. So it's not really related to the user's current context, so it's to its current position, to, its, to the, uh, their real uh, required services. And it's not really uh, useful for mobile devices like portable mobile phones and devices that are really offline in the moment of when, when they look for, for service. Then there are some more recent developments. So this is just a small, uh, small selection. So phone themselves, they have developed a connection manager for Symbian S60 devices that uh, can locate and also automatically connect to, to phone hotspots when you <coughs> provide your account information. Um, again, this is phone only, of course. Um, there's an um, approach by a company called DeviceScape that tries to exploit the fact that uh, when you're on a public hotspot, you s you normally you still have DNS access because the, the whole login mechanism is based on that. And so they are trying to provide infrastructure where the user can then connect to their DNS server and they exploit these infrastructure to guess uh, which provider the user is coming from and then providing hints over DNS responses how to log into that particular uh, provider or hotspot. So you need, you need proprietary software to do that and you need the device scape infrastructure in the DNS. Then there are things like the iPass hotspot finder, an offline tool for, for laptop systems where you also can pre-download maps so it goes in a useful direction. You can download this when you're online and then look at it when you're offline and then search on, based on different um, criteria. But in general, um, we can notice um, some significant shortcomings. So we see many provider-specific solutions, so they're not really useful for a general service location approach. Um, there is typically no structured update mechanism. So viewers, they have to manually update their databases if there is such a concept. Um, and most of these services, they are focusing on wireless LAN any, anyway. So it's only a particular service. It's not general in the sense that you can also distribute information about uh, higher layer services. So the service maps um, idea I'm, I'm talking about, um, so roughly speaking, it's, it's a more generalized approach for network information services that is intended to provide information um, for different kinds of networks. So it is also intended to be useful in offline scenarios. So it's, uh, you don't have to be online to, to, to guess where the, your next uh, opportunity um, of access. And it's um, designed to truly really, uh, be deployable in a large scale context. Um, so it's based on mobile users, so receivers, um, receiving service map information from different sources, maintaining them on their own, and then using this uh, in the moment when they are looking for a service. So this is um, motivated by the idea that we want to support offline usage because especially when you're looking at mobile wireless LAN usage, you cannot expect the mobile device to be always connected. And also we have a concept that um, uh, there can be a local service scope, so there's no common global view of services. So I can have a local hotspot, for example, an airplane that disseminates very specific, only locally interesting set information for the media on demand system, for example. So um, the service map architecture um, is based on uh, providers like Vodafone, T-Mobile, for example, delivering their service information um, to users. So I can subscribe, to, if I'm a Vodafone customer, I can subscribe to their information service. Um, but there's also a concept uh, of, for example, filtering and aggregation. So if I'm, for example, the information service for Copenhagen, I would, um, I would uh, subscribe to, say, Vodafone's uh, information service, then filter out all the uh, non-interesting information for, let's say, other cities in Denmark, and then distribute um, the information uh, in the Copenhagen area. So there's a concept that 
um, for source maps, you can choose different transports. So we support things like broadcast multicast transports, so using reliable multicast protocols. But you can also do things like query uh, response interactions and you can also subscribe to information sources. So when the idea is that you at one time have a stable basis and then you will only be supplied with the updates uh, by a provider. So the normal operation would be that a mobile user, a mobile user's device would uh, kind of subscribe to different sources, to the, their um, preferred provider, to their uh, campus network. Um, and also, p potentially, if the device supports that, uh, utilize different network interfaces for that. Um, so in the following, I will talk a bit about some technical approaches, achievements that we uh, have um, also described in the full paper that's uh, in the core system. Um, so we have developed a, a data model. So the, the service map information is, uh, is XML-based, but that's not really useful to be displayed in the slide. So I'm trying to explain it uh, uh, in the structural way. So if I were a service provider like uh, Vodafone, for example, um, I would structure my information in different locations, different services, and information about me as a provider itself, and then combine this to different service instances. So the idea is that I will typically have the same wireless LAN access service in all the places, but just different locations. And so if I do aggregation from different providers, I will have also different providers, of course. And there's a general um, yeah, data model for, for structuring service uh, maps like this. And there's a concept of uh, adding application-specific um, extensions. So we call that, that um, refinements. So that is the extension mechanism we are using here. And these refinements, um, they can be, there's a concept that they don't necessarily have to be distributed in the, in the same delivery context. So they can be externally and they can be referenced in a service map. So if I'm really have a, have a, have a constrained bandwidth, uh, I could just transmit the crucial information and then link to the uh, additional information, for example. This is really uh, intended to be efficient in broadcast scenarios, for example, where we have different channels and you would transmit the really uh, crucial information for, for getting access in one channel and then the additional information like tariffing schemes, for example, in a different channel. Um, so I, I, I mentioned a, a bit the filtering and aggregation uh, idea that we have here. So um, again, I, I can, I, I can deploy, in, um, I can construct different um, say infrastructures or architectures where provider independent aggregators combine service maps from uh, different providers and the different tools of, of how to do that. So I can kind of um, automatically uh, filter all these service descriptions that match to certain um, tags. So there's a concept that providers can uh, assign free text tags to their descriptions. Of course, I can also filter by location. So that's one of the uh, more important uh, filter uh, mechanisms. And also, I, I can just search by uh, arbitrary uh, XPath filter. So I can just, if I look for a very specific service and I, I know what has to be in the description, I can just filter based on that. And so because we have the concept of um, I can receive a service information from different sources but all the different transport networks, we need a concept of uniquely identifying uh, service information. So there's a URN uh, concept for that. Um, and URNs, they, they serve as identifiers for service maps themselves for fragments uh, and also for the ref and refinements of the additional information. And we have to find some comparison rules where I can say, okay, this service, uh, this uh, URN that may also contain a filter um, actually represents a subset of another service map, for example. And we have described a, a system where we can, over the DNS, we can um, kind of um, fetch domain-specific uh, translation rules. Um, so if I want to know, for example, um, what is the URL for fetching the Vodafone description? So I'm picking on the Vodafone example. Um, so I, I would uh, go to their um, 
DNS uh, uh, service, and they would return me uh, the specific URL, for example, in the DBBH uh, broadcast network or uh, over IP and HTTP. Um, so we have looked at um, how to really get this working um, without um, expecting too many um, fixed configurations. So it's a um, bootstrapping approach, approach uh, is intended to identify uh, service map services in, in an unknown network, in a phone hotspot, for example. So how to ob obtain the basic configuration information, the so service map URIs, I need to fetch the information. And there's a bootstrapping procedure um, based on broadcast multicast, so there's a predefined flute session that I can join um, to obtain the information automatically. And also there's a unicast variant uh, where I can do this over local DNS queries. So details of this are on the paper. Um, so one of the more interesting or more important aspects um, of this is, of course, um, security. So if I have a concept that I can have arbitrary aggregators and, and filter processes in the distribution chain, um, I have to do deal with uh, authenticity and integrity. So otherwise, other people could just forge the uh, information of uh, a commercial provider and uh, perform denial of service attacks. Um, so still, I, I want to allow for this filtering and aggregation, but still I want to uh, authenticate uh, the service information and be sure that it's really coming from the um, original service provider. So um, we have developed a solution based on, on uh, hash keys and XML digital signatures that allows to uh, do this in a, in a fairly efficient way. So you can, you would probably, you, you would uh, sign hashes of um, components of service maps and you can still validate the integrity even if a filtering or aggregation changes the original uh, information set. So finally, we have uh, worked a lot on implementations. So we um, have, of course, done two things. We have developed the infrastructure uh, for distributing service information, and we have worked on, on client software. So um, different variants. So uh, of course, we've also done a Google Maps-based mashup uh, web-based system um, where you can kind of uh, demonstrate the, the features. But what we actually want is a offline tool, of course, that you can um, carry around. And you don't need internet access to really uh, view this information. And we have also done that. And that's meant by the mobile client. So here you can, can see that, that, that's the campus of uh, Bremen Uni University. And so this we have developed together with an industry partner uh, with the goal to identify different yeah, facilities, services in a larger campus. Not only wireless LAN, but also things like printers and, and like that. So they are all kind of associated to a geographic uh, or civic location. Um, and you can then kind of select, that is the, 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 the tech uh, cloud where you can just select services by free text uh, uh, descriptions. And then you can kind of select different uh, service types and then you we will display only those who are currently reachable by you, and you can kind of define your range and so on. But the, the main, ad, main idea is actually that uh, most of this should actually happen automatically. So that actually, we don't want the user to look at this. We want the user to uh, define their profile in advance, and then have a tool automatically associating like wireless well, like network services, for example. So we have um, kind of develop tools that gather information from different hotspot providers like phone, like T-Mobile, Vodafone, and, and whatever. And then we are able to, um, uh, we specify a location to kind of select um, the optimal service based on our personal uh, tariff uh, scheme, for example. So if, if I'm mobile, I won't be interested in, in a service where I have to buy a one-day uh, connection service. So I want to have a more flexible scheme, for example, and this, this I can specify. And so finally, this is the actually mobile client that we have uh, developed um, for, in the, for Nokia N95 um, mobile phone. So this has GPS, so it knows where it is. It has wireless LAN. It has also 3G interfaces. And um, 
So basically, this looks like the web-based um, approach, and actually the, the user interface is web-based, but um, all the, um, the software is running locally, so there's no internet access at this moment when I'm browsing the services. So um, with a local application that uh, acts um, as a web server for this web-based application. And um, so the ultimate goal would, would be that the phone has this software running in the background and then connect automatically to appropriate uh, services. So the issue uh, with, with that is that current um, mobile phone software um, platforms are not really um, encouraging you to, to do that. So it's, they have their um, limited interfaces and it's really difficult to, to have a software that um, automatically uh, switches between networks 3G, uh, wireless LAN, and maybe in future uh, DVBH, for example. So this is uh, the real automatic association with these mobile devices is uh, still a current work item for us. Okay, um, we've done some some measurements, uh, some some tests, and um, so actually um, two applications I will I'll talk about. So one is the uh, ins uh, installation in our university campus. And one is a mobile scenario where I'm a mobile, mobile user and I'm going along a certain path, like in a, in a tram, for example, I'm trying to exploit um, open hotspots or, or co even commercial hotspots on my, my way. So for the campus now, we have focused on the uh, multicast distribution of sales information. So we have set up all the, the bootstrapping processes and have kind of tried to measure Two things. So, um, the first thing is, what is the actually um, utilization of the network we are in, we are uh, introducing by constantly distributing sales information? But that's what we actually want to do. And um, so, how can we kind of uh, play with uh, parameters like uh, for air correction and sending rates and whatever uh, to achieve a a low sending rate, so a, a low utilization of the network, but still a decent um, response time for the, for the client. So that's all described in the paper. And um, so we, we have been using Flute, so an ITF multicast protocol for that, and have sent out data about 400 access points, and have kind of played with different bandwidths. And so one of the issues with these large Campus networks is, of course, that you always have constant, so in, in, in typical configuration, you always have constant broadcast and multicast uh, background traffic. So and if you add on that, you, are, you can easily uh, hit the limit that's often set to one megabit per second. Uh, so you really have to go down with your bandwidth and you really have to um, accommodate uh, packet loss and, and so on. So when, that's what we have described in, in, in our paper. So the, useful parameters for a typical uh, campus uh, configuration. And then we have played with these. Of course, the last one here is just the query response um, as opposed to the um, broadcast distribution. Of course, this is always faster because I can always um, turn my device on and fetch what I'm looking for. But the idea is that and if I have many users, it's more efficient than, than to receive it over, this over broadcast. And um, so you know, the, the, the conclusion here is that you can really do this and you really don't have to spend much uh, sending rate uh, to achieve useful uh, results here. The mobile scenario, um, then we have kind of, uh, we've done sim um, different simulations um, for, for mobile wireless LAN usage. So we have a, a different research project that is uh, focusing on really using wireless LAN in difficult mobile scenarios like in high-speed trains or high-speed cars. And this is, was kind of the motivation for this. And um, here the, the challenge is that I, I know that there are, there are multiple access points uh, in my environment. So normally I would just go by and do a sensing and then try to log in, fail to log in, try the next one and whatever. And here the idea is that we provide the information about different uh, opportunities in, in advance. And then I know where I am, and I know um, that I would, would probably try to avoid this one, but better just focus on the green ones, for example, and, and thereby optimize my connectivity. So this is 
currently at the simulation stage only, but um, we have seen some uh, promising results here. Um, in order to um, really keep the information set uh, updated, we have defined a contribution uh, mechanism. So users um, can walk around with their mobile devices and uh, they can sense uh, information like war driving applications and then they can contribute this information to the uh, service map um, infrastructure. So there's a, there's a concept of an up upload server that uh, receives this information from different users, does some checks on consistency and uh, freshness uh, and so on, and then feeds this information um, into the service map infrastructure by comparing it with the, for example, official uh, T-Mobile Vodafone information. Um, this is especially important because most tools, when you look at them, are really uh, often not up to date. And so especially when you are interested in um, conveying information about open hotspots or community hotspots, uh, this approach helps you um, yeah, to, to generate a, a useful data set uh, essentially effortlessly. So we have developed a software that you can carry around and then it would just sense the data and then finally upload it. And other users can then receive it over the usual service map uh, infrastructure. Um, another thing we have recently played with, um, so um, early in the second slide I showed you a traditional uh, wireless LAN display where, where it takes information about different hotspot providers and so on. Um, so actually, um, if you are in a foreign environment and you have no other way um, to obtain certain information, um, it can still be useful uh, to go to a display and some uh, modern phones like the N95 or all Japanese phones, for example, they have a QR code reader and uh, could just uh, read this as a URL and then use this for a local service request uh, in the uh, specific hotspot they are currently in. So um, we are currently thinking of using this for the wireless LAN maintenance uh, at our campus. So where there's always the issue that, that maintenance people are running around and they, re they don't know actually um, which access point they are currently looking at. So um, this is an an another application we, we are currently investigating. So to, um, to associate this information with uh, information sets for different users, so normal users and, for example, maintenance personnel. And so this would then <laughs> link to the configuration interface for the uh, MRTG traffic uh, stats and, and, and whatever. And um, this, we, have, we have made this uh, work on the Nokia N95, N N N N N so it's really a workable solution. One issue though, um, so when you operate a larger wireless LAN installation, people actually don't want to see that they are access points. So like workers are concerned about uh, radiation and so about and, and whatever. And so it's, it's a crucial issue if you really want to associate a clearly visible sign to each access point, as is currently uh, under investigation. Okay, so um, I, I try to, to uh, convey the, the uh, idea that automating access to wireless LAN hotspots is currently a major challenge. So it's, uh, we see more and more devices who actually have wireless LAN and who have features like uh, voice of IP telephony and who could really make use of that, but still the user is not really well supported. So we have seen first developments that are becoming available, um, but still most of them, they are really provider specific and they're really not targeted at, at mobile users. So it's more or less mainly web-based and uh, especially not uh, provider independent. So network service maps uh, is intended as a general approach. So it's application and provider independent. And um, so what I've not talked about today is the different transport services and so on as in the previous paper. Um, but I've tried to show you um, how we can accommodate different organizational configurations with the filtering and aggregation approach, for example. And um, so this was the, the focus of the, the paper and, and this presentation. 
And so uh, we are really hoping um, to, to leverage community contributions over our contribution interface. Um, and uh, you can really participate if you want. So there's a website where you can look at uh, more information and also download some software and try with that. Thank you. OK. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, if you have uh, uh, some questions, any questions to, to date? Yeah. One question uh, regarding your um, security solution on based on these hash trees. I mean, the traditional, I'm not really into this, yeah. but the traditional approach is uh, that uh, the RSA public key uh, uh, cryptography is computational, more computationally more expensive, but the hash trees uh, extend the storage uh, on the price of, uh, is, uh, pay the price of storage. How much is the overhead you, you introduce by, I mean, the storage overhead, the data overhead, uh, by introducing these hash trees? Yeah, that's, a, that's a good question. So it's, uh, it can be up to, up to uh, 30, 40%. So it's, and that's, that, that's an issue. Um, so um, it, it, it all, so, so, um, so um, when you look at the data model and the security approach, um, of course you can uh, achieve huge gains by just applying compression to that. So this is what we are currently doing to make it more efficient. And, uh, but yeah, so if you really want to, to provide hard security, you have to do some compromises. That's, there's no other way. And of course we would be looking at different approaches, but this has currently been the, the most uh, yeah, useful one for us. Thank you. Any more questions? Any more questions? Okay. So thank you. Our uh, thank you. Yes. Our our next speaker is uh, Matthias Bellis. Uh, he is a member of the um, Internet Research Team at the University of Applied Science of uh, Hamburg. So, Matthias. So yeah. Thanks, Esther, for the nice introduction. Um, I will talk about a um, uh, mechanism to overcome uh, Oops. multicast intradomain, deplo intra-domain deployment complexity. And uh, this work is a joint work with Thomas, who is also there. Um, if you keep a short look on the agenda, first of all, I will talk about the problems and potentials of IP layer multicast. After that, I will introduce distributed hash tables, which are a mechanism to construct peer-to-peer -peer overlay networks. And I will also talk to, uh, shortly about uh, overlay multicast itself. And uh, after that, I will um, present our hybrid shared tree architecture. And finally, a conclusion and an outlook is given. Um, yeah, as we have learned yesterday from Kevin Almerod, Multicast is still under debate um, from the scientific uh, point of view as well as from the practical point of view. Um, DVB and IPTV are on the way. Multicast helps us to reduce the backbone traffic load um, and it saves the limited capacity of, uh, of radio sets. If you look on other applications like video conferencing or distributed learning, which benefits from um, uh, which benefits if the uh, group participants are uh, mobile, um, the, receive, the group participants are senders uh, and receivers. And what is here important is that the, um, that, the, um, that the devices are lightweight devices, so the transmission cost plays an important role. It is relevant if the, uh, if the sender uh, sends the packet once, once time or n times. Um, yeah, multicast is also uh, also relevant for self-configuration autonomous networks because the multicast group address is um, node independent and loca location independent. So if a node wants uh, um, a service, it just joins to the multicast group, and if the service is on, the uh, service traffic is um, transmitted to the node. Unfortunately, multicast uh, is 
not really deployed, it's only deployed in, a, uh, in restricted local domains. And uh, why is it so? Why is it so? Um, first, we should look on intradomain multicast. Intradomain multicast means that the traffic is uh, only distributed in a single administrative domain, which makes uh, a lot of things easier. The routing is done by internet uh, edge routers, which uh, have higher of the spare capacities as the internet core routers. And um, yeah, a lot of the, some of the scaling problems which are with um, multicast uh, routing protocols are invisible because the number of participants are uh, limited. The advantage, uh, uh, um, the deployment of intradomain multicast is also pushed because um, we have uh, a, lot, a lot of layer two protocols which implement um, which supports uh, multicast, like Vimex or Ethernet. And um, yeah, if you look on the, on the kind of multicast routing protocols, we have dense, dense mode protocols, uh, which floods the source announcement. Um, but we have also sparse protocols, with, uh, which, um, which established um, some anchor points in the infrastructure to, uh, to inform the, the designated routers of the receivers about the source and which uh, distributed the traffic um, to the receivers. So it uh, sounds a bit complicated, but you have to keep in mind that uh, the deployment complexity is, is reduced because um, we are just looking on, uh, on one single domain. There's also a new approach around the so-called bidirectional PIM. Bidirectional PIM uh, pre-established uh, the, the whole multicast uh, share tree. So um, um, the states are decoupled from the, from the data plane. Uh, if, it's, if there's a source, the whole, the whole share tree will be established. Nevertheless, if there uh, is, are receivers or not. Um, all of these will be com more complicated if you think about to, um, to to distribute the, the multicast traffic between different multicast domains, between different ISPs. And um, yeah, that's the so-called interdomain multicast. The problem statement of interdomain multicast um, is that, that, that you have to, uh, to announce the, so the source, the multicast source between, the, between these domains, and you have to establish a, a distribution tree between uh, these domains. And um, yeah, as we heard yesterday uh, too, there are a lot of objections to, to do this. Um, one of these is um, the intransparently -trans interwoven service models of uh, this unicast. So if you turn on uh, multicast, there's a fear to, uh, to degrade the, the unicast quality. And yeah, there are also some technical objections. Um, uh, First of these is the uncontrolled load on backbone sorted. What you have to note is that every, every receivers uh, initiate a state on the, on the router and um, automatically, and that's, this, um, that's not controlled of the um, internet router itself. Um, another point is that a lot of the multicast routing protocols use reverse pass forwarding. That means the distribution tree is constructed from the receivers to the source. But obviously, the traffic is sent from the source to the receivers. And unfortunately, 50% uh, of the backbone traffic uh, of the backbone routes are asymmetric. So the traffic um, is, not, uh, is probably not optimal. Um, there are some approaches around to, over to overcome the interdomain multicast problem. One is um, the source specific multicast. That means that the receiver join not only joins a group, but also to a source uh, S. And uh, what you can do then is uh, uh, construct the source space tree um, automatically and directly from the worst pass forwarding. So you don't need any um, special infrastructure like rendezvous points, or you don't need um, uh, flooding mechanisms because you know the source. Um, and uh, consequently, you have an immediately optimized tree and uh, traffic flow, respectively. The consequences of this is you have uh, enormously reduced deployment complexity. And, uh, but 
unfortunately, there are also some disadvantages. One of these is, uh, 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 is that you cannot aggregate uh, the, the, the states because the states are so specific. You also lost um, the generality of multicast, as we discussed earlier, um, because you have to know the source address. And um, this must be done um, via websites or the session description protocol. So the um, so specific multicast is uh, not really suitable for is not suitable for self configuration tasks because the multi the, the join is uh, is associated to the source. Um, yeah, there arise some some more problems um, of in multicast if. We are in the context of mobility. Um, every IP layer movement resides in the change of the distribution tree. Um, and we have to distinct uh, two, two sides. The one side is the receiver mobility. If the receiver moves, you have only, only to reestablish a branch of the multicast, which is possible but um, which is also a time-consuming time task. Um, the more heavyweight problem is the sender mobility problem, is the sender mobility. Um, first of all, you have to note that, uh, uh, that a lot of applications, every application that used uh, RTP, for example, um, identify the multicast streams by the source address. And uh, that's the one part. The other part is, if you look on the infrastructure, um, you have a source specific tree. Source specific trees means that the root of the tree is bounded to the, uh, uh, to the multicast uh, source address, and this source address has to be topologically correct. Uh, so um, the uh, unicast address, the source address of the, so uh, the unicast address of the source has a dual meaning of, on the one hand. It is um, a logical identifier for the application. On the other hand, it's a topological identifier for the infrastructure. And uh, this is so also called this um, address duality problem. And um, if the source moves, also if, if, if the source address changes, the tree collapses because the root moves, and the uh, reconstruction of the tree, of the whole tree, is um, is a really really time-consuming task and uh, absolutely not suitable for real-time applications. Um, further on, the receivers have also learned um, the new source address because they have to um, change their source specific join. Um, this problem is a little bit more relaxed if you look on shared tree because um, the multicast distribution is done via the fixed rendezvous point, but uh, you have to turn the packets to the rendezvous point, which is an overhead. Um, yeah. Solutions that uh, want to overcome these problems should keep in mind that um, the routing protocols uh, must should be unchanged, and um, that the mobility management should be handled at the internet edge routers. Um, one simple solution is uh, the uh, tunneling via the home agent. That means that the source tunnels all traffic to the um, to the home agent, and the home agent redistributes the uh, traffic to the receivers. So if the source moves, um, the root of the, uh, of the tree uh, is fixed because it is the home agent. On the other side, if the, is the, if the receivers are the mobile node, um, the home agent joins to the multicast uh, group instead of the receivers and um, gets the multicast traffic and tunnels it to the receivers. So you, have, you don't have to reestablish the branches of the tree. Um, that's, it has a poor performance. If, especially if you think that the uh, uh, home agent is far away from the mobile node and the group, and the mobile node and the group are closed together, are closed. Um, bidirectional PIM um, allows us to, to overcome these problems because it is a self um, uh, mobility agnostic uh, due to the uh, establishment of the um, uh, of the tree. Of the, sh of the distribution tree using uh, a virtualized rendezvous point. But um, uh, it does not solve the interdomain problem. So um, um, but what we learned yesterday, too, too is that um, there are some um, 
so op there are some op opposite ideas to IP layer multicast, which are uh, based on overlay networks, and the overlay networks is built on top of the internet. And um, if we are here talk about overlay networks, we mean structured overlay networks and peer-to-peer -peer overlay networks that don't uh, use any dedicated infrastructure. Um, yeah, overlay networks ease the, uh, the deployment complexity problem. And uh, one famous approach for to construct an overlay peer-to-peer -peer network uh, are the so-called distributed hash tables. Um, uh, the idea of distributed hash tables are that um, every node in the underlay, either every, um, for example, internet node, um, has a uh, unique identifier in this network, like the IP address or DNS name or something like this. And uh, this um, unique ID is mapped into uh, to a hash value. And um, the routing in the overlay is done using these hash values. The routing information itself are distributed among all overlay nodes in a very efficient and scalable way. Um, as we have fewer, um, fewer nodes as um, hash values, we have some holes in the, in the hash space, hash address space, so um, that um, some that, that nodes are responsible for a range of addresses uh, to, um, uh, to make the routing uh, possible. Um, there are many algorithms and implementations around. Um, some, uh, two of the fam most famous are Pastry and Cord. Um, yeah, you can use then these, or based on the uh, distributed hash table, you can also establish an uh, overlay uh, uh, multicast distribution tree. W one one uh, possibility is to flood to flood the multicast traffic in, in, the, in this overlay. The other one is to construct a tree. The typical approach here is to uh, hash the group address, and the, uh, this hash value defines the rendezvous point, and the routing inside the overlay is, uh, after the, ha after the um, rendezvous point is defined, um, is routing done like in PMSM. The main problem of all overlay approaches are the so-called overlay delay stretch and the link stretch. Stress the overlay delay stretch defines uh, the rate of the overlay pass links to the underlay pass links, and the link stress uh, is the number of duplicate packets per link. Um, as it is shown in some experiments, um, uh, you can minimize the, uh, the link, st the delay stretch for, uh, for um, DHT, like uh, uh, pastry, for the DHT pastry to a factor of two, so the, um, the hops you take in a, um, to reach one overlay node um, as a double one as, uh, as if you used um, pure IP layer uh, transmission. So if we conclude uh, this, these intermediate results, um, we, uh, we have interdomain multicast, which is uh, spread out. But uh, interdomain multicast is uh, not global, not global uh, available we, because uh, because we have a high deployment complexity and um, you, you can uh, uh, reduce or uh, yeah, you can reduce the deployment complexity if you use overlay multicast um, or overlay networks uh, in general because they are decoupled from the ISP or the infrastructure. Unfortunately, uh, they are less efficient as, uh, as pure IP layer um, multicast. So um, if, we, if we combine this research, why, uh, why we don't uh, use a selective use of overlay multicast? And uh, this, is, this is the idea of our approach. Um, the main idea is uh, that we are uh, leave the uh, intradomain untouched. There is the normal layer three, layer, uh, uh, layer two, layer three multicast behavior. But um, between these, between, between the multicast domains, we use uh, an overlay, which is built, uh, on, uh, which is built uh, with the help of a DHT. So, um, the deployment complexity with the scheme is reduced because um, you can deploy it incrementally. Every, uh, every ISP who wants uh, global, global multicast just uh, needs, 
to establish a so-called internet domain multicast gateway. Um, and this internet domain multicast gateway, IMG, uh, we s sits between um, the between the um, in, between the multicast domain and um, the uh, the internet backbone. Um, you know, yeah. And as a as a uh, as a DHCV use pastry because um, pastry uh, has uh, proximity awareness, so the overlay stretch is um, very low, and it also uses uh, prefix based routing which is shown uh, soon. Here's a, um, a, a picture of the architecture. Oops. Whoop, whoop. Ah, yeah. Okay, here we have this cloud um, represents the multicast domains. And um, uh, besides the multicast domain and the internet backbone, there is a, a IMG. What you have to keep in mind is that the um, IMG is a separate entity. It has not to be run on, uh, on the backbone router itself. And um, the IMGs are connected via an overlay. So independent of the, um, of the backbone routers, internet backbone routers. Um, bec before we uh, come to the, to the uh, routing details, we have to think about how the um, distribution tree is a, in the overlay is constructed. Um, yeah, first of all, every IMG uh, has an overlay address, which is uh, formed by uh, the hash value of the IMG ID in the underlay. Also, uh, for example, the hash value of the IP address of the IMG. Um, every IMG learns uh, about all multicast group members to, um, to realize an instantaneous uh, multicast traffic flow. But uh, the multi membership updates are communicated incrementally. Because that means that you only need to inform the other IMGs about the re receiver um, uh, for if, the, if the first receiver came or the last, in, in, uh, um, the last receiver guns. Um, yeah, how is, the, how is the distribution tree constructed? Um, we, uh, we used here for this as a so-called so common prefix tree. A prefix tree is a well-structured tree. Um, uh, in a binary, uh, binary alphabet, um, the, uh, the, the tree is constructed as follows. Every left or um, first uh, one, step, one step back, um, Every, every inner node in the prefix T is labeled uh, with a prefix. And um, the prefix grows uh, in, uh, in the way to the, to the leaves. And uh, how, how are the labels are, um, named? Uh, this is done in a well-structured uh, way. Um, every left child in this example, every left child um, gets, uh, well, every yeah, every left, every prefix digit of the left child is a one, and every um, prefix, uh, the next prefix digit of the right child is a zero. So if you have the root, um, the next, uh, the prefix is one, and for the next child is, is one, 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 because it is left. And here is the same. And what, we, and what is here happened too is that um, this is a pass compressed tree, so we eliminate one one way branches. Um, as the um, as the prefixes are activated, we have on the uh, the leaves represents the, the node ID itself. And if you look a bit more in detail, we see that. Um, there exist some uh, nodes from the, uh, in the path from the leaf to the, road, uh, to the root, um, which are a prefix of the node uh, of the nodes of the node ID. So um, this uh, this label is O, -O, -O star, and this is a prefix of uh, this node ID. This is the same, and so on. So we have um, we can say that, um, or what what we say is that. that 
that all of these nodes are a subgraph, and we call also, which is important for the further steps, we call also um, all immediate all immediate neighbors uh, nodes um, to this subgraph. Um, yeah, we call these neighbors all immediate nodes connected to this subgraph. Um, and uh, yeah, we use then this uh, constructed tree, which is only based on, on the receiver uh, IDs as a bidirectional shared tree. How is the routing done? Um, first of all, uh, if, if a source packet comes uh, to the IMG, this, the IMG has to determine its position uh, inside the prefix tree. So um, in this case, here's the source. Um, it knows, okay, my, my overlay ID is uh, three O's and three ones. So I'm here, and all of these nodes um, to the uh, to the root um, shares shares a prefix with me. Yeah. Um, after after the the, the source MG is now its position the tree, and the uh, routing algorithm says just forward um, the multicast traffic uh, uh, downwards to all to all neighbors. In this case. Um, this is a neighbor for this uh, source and this one, and um, for, uh, uh, for, for this receiver there exist, uh, it, it, or, yeah, this receiver is also a neighbor. So it sends, um, it would send uh, in the distribution tree the, the packet to the, to, to, the, um, to the prefixes, and the question is now how the um, prefixes are resolved. For that, um, the um, IMG looks up the prefix in the uh, DHT routing table and um, can transmit the multicast packet um, to the underlay uh, to the underlay node. Whoops. Okay, what happens with the intermediate um, forwarders with intermediate vertices? Um, as the tree is a recursive structure, it uh, it works as, as a source, similar to the source. Um, first of all, it has also to now its position in the tree. Um, as uh, we have uh, many, many overlay nodes for, for, for one prefix, um, it cannot, um, uh, it is not um, derivable. Uh, which um, which prefix um, to which pre to, to which prefix was the, the uh, packet was uh, this time? So we have um, to carry uh, the the destination prefix in the uh, in the packet, and if the packet arrived at the overlay node, whoop, from here to here, and um, the the, um, the overlay node now its position in the distribution tree, and the routing algorithm says um, forward is downward to the next um, ranging point, which will in this example this one and this one for this overlay node. And um, as um, as there um, some as it is possible that the um, prefix uh, not lies in the address range. Of the, uh, of the overlay node, um, it has to check if the prefix, uh, destination prefix is associated with it, and if it is not so, um, it has not to, con to consider the distribution tree, it just forward it to the next overlay node um, with the, with the uh, as a destination address, the destination prefix. Um, yeah, what, what, uh, what are the benefits uh, of this approach? Uh, the first one is um, we, we leave the uh, layer two, layer three multicast uh, in the end systems untouched. The other one is that the um, per packet processing cost is uh, strictly uh, predictable because the uh, um, replication load on the forward limit is limited by the size of the prefix alphabet. Um, that's why uh, that is. Um, as you, uh, it is why the um, uh, because the um, 
um, the, every, the number of childs in the, in the prefix tree is, um, is uh, limited, well, is limited uh, due to the, um, the number of the prefix alphabet, the size of the prefix alphabet. Um, yeah, we have also no dedicated overlay nodes, uh, so we avoid bottlenecks and uh, single points of failure. And in combination with um, redirectional PIM, we have a mobility diagnostic routing framework because the, um, uh, the forwarding states and the, the group and state management is uh, as in bidirectional PIM in the hybrid shared tree architecture um, decoupled from the forwarding plan. Um, yeah, some conclusions. Um, uh, yeah, we have discussed some uh, p potentials and pitfalls of multicast. We have also introduced the uh, um, hybrid architecture uh, which interconnects multicast domains and um, reduced uh, the um, multicast deployment complexity. In the future, we will optimize the, um, algorithms, the algorithm and also the, we want to improve the storage of the um, prefix tree. Yeah, and the analysis will be done in an analytic simulated way, but also in real world experiments um, using the Planet Lab platform. So thanks for your attention. Thanks, Matthias. Uh, we have uh, some time for questions. Is there any questions for Matthias? No? Yes. Ah, mm -hmm. Yeah, one, quest one question. Um, so I assume that a, a IMG would typically be located in an uh, ISP's connection to the backbone. So yeah. Appearing yeah. It, it, the IMG must um, sit between the um, uh, multicast domain and the internet backbone. Oh, it only needs. Okay. So um, one of the issues with uh, IP multicast deployment has historically been that it's difficult to really charge for used resources like bandwidth, router capacities, and and so on. Yeah. So do you think your approach would kind of help to to yeah, overcome what this? You, yeah. What you have to keep in mind is that the IMG must not uh, run on the on the backbone router itself. It only uh, need to sit between the between the yeah. domains. And so so um, uh, you uh, do, you don't stress the, the um, resources on the backbone router itself. Yeah. So uh, that itself would, I think, reduce the complexity. Yeah, my question was more in the direction. So what would be the motivation for an ISP to really operate such an System. Oh yeah, that's a bit as of the um, discussion yesterday. Huh? As Kevin said, the end user um, doesn't care about um, that it's multicast or not. But um, what, what, what you it used um, obviously for uh, the benefit for the uh, for the ISP is that the, the traffic inside in the in the ISP domain is reduced. That is um, that is obviously so, and I think that that is a, that is a benefit for the ISP. Not you cannot solve it uh, to the to the customer, but um, for the ISP it would be a benefit. Yeah. Okay. Cool. I thanks. Think. Ah, yeah. Well, sehr praktisch. <laughs> ah, one more question. Hmm? Yeah, it's it's about uh, about security in general, the mm -hmm. access control. Mm -hmm. uh, I have read sometimes in the past about the lack of security of the multi multicast schemas because it's difficult to avoid uh, people connecting to a group um, uh, either either uh, listening or, or even emitting content mm -hmm. using the, uh, the the multicast group. Have you considered the possibility because this looks like it would be easier to, to implement security uh, measures in the in the network. Have you considered this? Yeah, yeah because um, I, I First one, you have uh, the, the, li the uh, limited administrative um, ISP domain, and the one other one is that um, the multicast traffic is gone to the to the IMGs, and the um, and uh, inside the internet, the um, the traffic is only routed between the I uh, between the IMGs, and so yeah, you can uh, why not? It's just, also it is so easier to to implement security. Yeah. You can do some uh, timelets, uh, crypto timelets between the IMGs, for example. Yeah. Yeah. 
Any more questions? Okay, thanks, Matthias, again. Okay. Our next speaker is uh, Jos Howlett. He is uh, working in Ukerna. He is the technical uh, lead of the Ukerna's middleware program. So. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? Good. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Esther. Um, I'm um, here to talk about um, why Jerome sucks and how to fix it. Um, actually, this isn't true. I'm not going to talk about that at all um, because it's quite simple. Edurome doesn't suck. Um, this is your first warning that this is not going to be a particularly conventional talk. In fact, Edurome rocks. Edurome, I'm convinced, is one of the best ideas in academic networking for several, well, for a long time. Um, it's, I think it's very useful to think how far we have come in changing network service delivery um, the last six or seven years. Six or seven years ago, people were still running around patching in cables every time a user came onto the network or needed changing to a different network. Four or five years ago, we started using SNMP and perhaps proprietary protocols like Cisco's uh, VMPS and VTP. <clears throat> With Edurome, we're really pushing forwards um, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the delivery of these services to the network. It's forcing institutions to think um, about delivering services in a much more dynamic way, depending on who the user is and what their requirements of the network is. Hundreds of institutions, I think, would agree with me because there are hundreds of institutions participating in Edurome and 26 NRENs. And as I said, it's really revolutionizing the way that we think about doing network service delivery. The network is changing from what was a very static, um, pretty unchanging cables and switches, and now we're thinking about pushing VLANs all over the place depending on who the user is, perhaps updating packet filters depending on who the user is, what sort of services they have um, rights to get to. So <clears throat> you might at this point be thinking, well, what on earth is this guy going to be talking about? The problem I think that at the moment Edurome is facing is that we've become um, a victim of our own success. Um, um, to, at the risk of sounding a bit like Donald Rumsfeld, um, when we, when, we, when we started Edurome, there, there, were, there were issues that we knew about that would probably be problems. Um, <laughs> and they've turned out to be problems, and much faster than we thought they would. Um, but there were also problems that we didn't realize were going to become problems. And unfortunately, these have also become problems much faster than we thought they were going to become problems. So what I want to do is explain what these problems are and try and dispel some of the myths, because when people start hearing about problems with anything, um, they immediately think that, oh, something's got a problem, therefore it's dead. Um, and there are some challenges with Edurome, and I want to just explain what these are um, and um, how these are being addressed by the communities that are building Edurome, specifically uh, the Terrana TF Mobility um, uh, group and the uh, JRA5, uh, the JRA5 group. Uh, I should mention, what I'm trying to do here is not evangelize. I'm sure everyone here is set in an Edurome evangelism um, talk. Um, I'm not here to evangelize. I'm trying to present a consensus um, view. Um, this, um, some of you may be familiar with this, this is something produced by Gartner for um, IT managers with big wallets and small brains. Um, it's to try and explain to managers um, in a, they, how technologies change. So uh, t a new technology comes along and there's a lot of excitement about it. People get very excited and you have the, the peak of ex uh, inflated expectations that you know, this technology is going to change the world. And then, of course, it starts getting widely deployed, and people discover problems with it. And then everyone becomes very disillusioned with the technology. And then gradually, these problems get, get fixed, and, and, and it just becomes part of, part of ordinary day. It just becomes part of the furniture, as we say in England. Um, and at the moment, Ed, Edurome is, I think, we've, with the last year or two, was probably the peak of ex inflated expectations. And we're rapidly uh, <laughs> dropping into the trough of disillusionment as we discover this is turning out to be a lot more difficult than we thought it was going to be. Um, there are three reasons for this. First is that because Edurome depends on some rather poorly implemented technologies. 
Um, this isn't our fault. If vendors provide us with technologies that they say work and they don't work as they should, um, then this is difficult. The second reason is that EduRome also relies on technologies that weren't really designed for what EduRome is trying to achieve. On the small scale, uh, within an institution or possibly within an NREN, you can see some of these technologies being appropriate. But when we start looking at these extremely large planetary scale confederation of federations, then it's becoming very obvious um, that they're not really fit for purpose. And finally, writing good policy is really, really very hard. The technology is the easy side of this. Writing policy is extremely difficult. Um, and um, as I said, we've got hundreds of institutions, 26 NRENs. Um, trying to get everyone to agree is, is very difficult. Um, I think most people are probably familiar with how Edgerome works, but I've just got a sort of Edgerome in a slide here, just in case um, there are some of you who aren't familiar. On the left uh, is the visitor's laptop, which we call a supplicant. I'm not keeping up with the arrows, just ignore them. Um, the supplicant authenticates, uh, sorry, associates with the access point, which is the authenticator. And this then sets in motion a chain of authentication um, requests and responses that happen between the supplicant and the user's authentication server on the right-hand side of the screen. And these, uh, these authentication requests and responses are passed along a chain of radius proxy servers. Um, this is sort of an instance for a particular NREN where you've got two universities and the NREN's central radius proxy server. In the case of um, the EduRome Confederation, with 26 NRENs, we also have another layer, which is the international uh, top-level radius proxy servers. So there can be a lot of radius proxy servers um, involved in that. That's the first thing to notice. Um, yeah. So what, <laughs> the, what are the problems? This is, this is a really sort of cathartic moment for me, being able to put this on screen. It's very enjoyable. Windows doesn't entirely suck. Um, the supplicant does, however, definitely suck. Why? The first reason is that the, it's, it's got a very limited number of authentication options. Um, you've got EAP-TLS, which is based on certificate-based um, certificate authentication. Um, and uh, I think it's reasonable to say that for a lot of use cases, user certificates are not a sensible way of authenticating users. The um, Microsoft implemented a password, a password-based authentication mechanism called EPEEP, which builds on EPTLS, so it's certificate-based, but the user doesn't have to have a certificate. Instead, they can present a password to authenticate themselves to the server. Um, unfortunately, the way Microsoft implemented this is that the, the password being passed to the server is, um, is, um, is, the, is actually an MSCHAP hash. Um, the upshot of this is that your user database, where you store your passwords, um, have to either be in the, um, effectively in the MS chat hash form itself or as plain text. And of course, many institutions keep uh, passwords in all sorts of different formats or hashes, um, SHA or uh, MD5 or, or all sorts. Um, <clears throat> so that's one problem. The other problem is that the supplicant won't authenticate against hidden SSIDs. The implication of this is that the EduRome SSID has to be broadcast. And this then causes problems with other vendors' crap stuff, because particularly access points, because access points have all sorts of different capabilities when it comes to what they will do with broadcast SSIDs. So for example, Cisco's access points, yep, they will allow you to do more than one broadcast SSID, but that will come with a, about two sides of A4 of caveats. And so, this makes it very difficult for institutions to deploy EduRome along with other local wireless services that they might want to do. The passwords are cached in the registry, and there's no way to take these passwords out without actually going into a registry editor and taking the, the password out yourself. This is not something that you want to encourage your users to be doing. And finally, and perhaps um, most problematic, it's very difficult to set up an EduRome configuration using the Windows XP supplicant. It takes about, at a minimum actually, I'd say, 20 steps to implement a sensible EduRome configuration. For some sites, it might be 23, 24 steps. And if you actually document this with a few screenshots, it takes about four sides of A4. And I've had, heard multiple stories of institutions saying that they have users who, who will read the first side of the A4 and expect that to be the end of it. They don't realize they have to turn over and do another three sides of A4. <laughs> 
Um, this, this has caused a lot of pain for us. It's, it's been a, um, an opportunity for other people. They have gone and um, built good supplicants, and there are some excellent third-party supplicants that people can buy, but for a lot of money. There are some open source supplicants um, that obviously don't have this cost implication. The first, and this is, this is the, the best known one, and is widely deployed at present uh, within um, our community, is Secure W2, which is a, a plugin that, that effectively it, it goes and sits on top of the Windows supplicant, um, but it, it gets rid of the password caching problem, which is good. And it also supports this authentication method called TTLS, which does allow you to authenticate against a much wider variety of, of backends, of, of uh, directories, for example. It addresses some of the problems, but not, not all. Secure W2 is a little bit rough around the edges. Much more recently, um, there is a new project um, called Open1x. This actually only started, well, this was only publicized last week. So this, this is, this is um, brand new news. It's a port of X supplicant, which some of you may be familiar with. It's, it's from uh, the Linux world um, to Windows. And, and it's being managed by um, an alliance of vendors. Uh, I've listed them there. And Ukerna. And we're hoping to contribute um, effectively um, the academic community's requirements to this supplicant so that um, we can hopefully end up with something that everyone can use. Um, that's the aim. PKI. Hmm. Um, PKI has its uses. I'm not disputing that. But for wireless authentication, it can cause problems. At the moment, because EEP wasn't designed, EEP, which is this wireless authentication protocol, it wasn't, really, it wasn't designed with security in mind. And, and um, when people realized the problems of this, they thought, oh, it's easy. We'll just wrap TLS around it, because TLS is really secure. But the problem is that once you bring TLS in, people then think, um, well, with TLS, you know, we, we normally use certificates for authentication. And no one understands PKI, least of all users. I don't think any users understand PKI. I know plenty of institutions within the UK, sorry, ed, sorry administra administrators of radius servers in the UK don't understand PKI. So deploying this has caused a lot of support headaches. Certificates are also rooted um, in Windows to, to um, certificate authorities that obviously cost a lot of money as well. Also very problematic is that the certificate-based certificate TLS handshake, the four-way handshake, is very verbose. You will perhaps pass uh, um, five to ten kilobytes, perhaps, of information during the handshake. Uh, if you're going to visit a website, this isn't a problem. It just means the website takes another half second or so to load. It's not really a problem in that sort of instance. For network-based authentication, we, we are worried about latencies of 10 to 20 milliseconds, because if you get latencies longer than that, then time-sensitive applications such as voice over IP start to break. So <coughs> um, with these very verbose authentications, <coughs> it's slow, as I said, and also fragile over lossy networks. And it should come as no surprise to any of us that wireless networks are very lossy. So. How are we trying to fix it? Well, thankfully, we now have the Terena Service Certificate Service, uh, which is a superb initiative from Terena, and it's been taken up very widely in the UK. We started it back in November, and in the six months since November, we've, I think, issued 400 certificates to our institutions. It's extremely popular. There are also, coming out, coming through the, the IETF process, um, there are also two um, strong EAP methods that don't use PKI. The first of these is EAP TLS PSK, which does use TLS, but it doesn't require certificates as credentials. Instead, it can use a pre-shared secret. EAP uh, GPSK, which stands for Generalized Pre-Shared Secret, is another strong password-based authentication system. The advantage, although the first of these, EAP TLS, it will still be a little bit verbose, much well, more verbose than EAP GPSK, they will still be significantly less verbose and much more reliable than using certificate-based authentication. Another obvious way to try and improve this is to actually try and use something other than um, uh, an unreliable transport. RADIUS sits on top of UDP, which is unreliable. Um, so perhaps we should consider using a reliable transport. Which brings me on to RADIUS. Radius, Radius is actually one of my favorite protocols. It was difficult for me to write that slide. Um, but it turns out that EduRoam is actually pushing the capabilities um, 
uh, sorry, edge was pushing the capabilities of RADIUS. RADIUS was really designed for use within a single administrative domain, and it does, does have some extensions for allowing you to proxy um, authentication requests between administrative domains, which is what Eduroam does. But Eduroam has taken that to the, the furthest sort of logical extent of, uh, that, that, that one can do. Um, so, for example, the routing of the radius packets. So, if, so I, I send, them, I give my credentials as, as Josh at ukerna.ac.uk. That ukerna.ac.uk is bound to the DNS. And the, the radius routing hierarchy follows the DNS. And this then causes problems with people from institutions or organizations that are .orgs, .edus, .nets, or any sort of .tld that we don't really have any control over. And uh, as an example of that, Ukerna is rebranding itself. And as of next month, I'm going to have a problem because we're going to be ja.net. I'm not quite sure what to do. I touched on this earlier, hierarchical routing is very fragile and very slow. I've done some testing here while I've been here using EPEEP, which is the standard Windows authentication protocol. It takes about 10 to 15 round trips, depending on how many packets get dropped. It's about a 250 millisecond round trip time. But 250 milliseconds is a quarter of a second. doesn't sound like very much, but they add up. Um, and it can take as long as four seconds, assuming that you don't drop a single packet over the wireless network and over the UDP connection all the way back home. Um, and as it turns out, I'm sort of seeing about a 2 to 5% packet loss from here all the way back to Ukerna, which means that perhaps one in four connection or so, one, every time I try and, sorry, we have one in four connections is failing. Um, it's not failing, but a packet is being dropped. And because RADIUS doesn't define what to do really about retransmissions, it just leaves it up to the administrator to configure timeouts and things. And the default sort of timeouts are about three to five seconds. This means that your, um, your authentication attempt might take up to 10 seconds. And this is probably what some of you may, may have noticed that some authentication, um, some of your authentications are taking a long time. And this isn't a reflection of the fact that the wireless network here is bad. It's a very good wireless network. It's just a reflection of the fact that getting the authentication message from here all the way um, to the UK using RADIUS is just not the best way to do it. RADIUS also has very poor support for interdomain authorization, um, which is to say that it's very difficult to pass information about the user to the visited institution where the user is so that the visited institution can make some kind of authorization decision as to whether to allow the user onto the network. In Eduroam at the moment, authentication is authorization. If you authenticate, you're authorized. But there are definitely use cases um, where um, this isn't desirable and you may want to have a bit more control over this. Radius isn't very good for this. The attributes, radius attributes, are exposed um, to uh, the proxy servers. They can be changed and they can be read without uh, any of the other parties knowing about it. And also, radius attributes are very inflexible compared to other sorts of attributes formats, such as SAML. Um, so <clears throat> how do we fix this? Well, RADSEC, this is a way of doing radius over TLS over TCP. So this provides us with much better security. It also provides us with peer discovery, so we can get rid of the hierarchy. So radius servers discover themselves without having to do this very long round trip up and down the hierarchy. Unfortunately, it's unlikely to gain traction in the ITF because the IETF is very busy trying to push diameter, which is the successor to RADIUS. The type of functionality that diameter will provide is roughly similar to RADSEC, but the problem is that there's only one commercial implementation and it's very expensive. So, happily, whichever one we decide to go for, we're not sure yet, which is the best approach, we probably need some of the same infrastructure components. So for example, we're probably going to need a public key infrastructure to allow uh, radius servers, when they're operating in this peer-to-peer -peer mode, to be able to authorize each other to, uh, and authenticate each other. For authorization, there are two interesting projects going on about um, at the moment. There's the Dame project, which we heard about on Monday afternoon, uh, which is being uh, run by the University of Mercia. There's also an activity um, in the Internet2, FWNA, Federated Wireless Network Access Group, um, uh, and this activity is called um, Radius SAML, which is where, again, well, in fact, both of these proposals use SAML attributes to try and uh, provide authorization information. Um, sometimes I think that perhaps we're trying to be a bit too clever, and for the use cases that we've identified, perhaps we could just, you know, um, cross our fingers 
and just use radius attributes and hope for the best. Maybe. Policy. This, this is the really difficult one. Um, I, I'd completely forgotten, actually, until the conference started on Monday, that um, the, the motto for the conference is Visible Services Transparent Networks. If you give um, your typical campus administrator a network and a firewall, the first thing you will not have is a transparent network. You will very quickly not have a transparent network. And um, this results in problems because consistency when you're trying to run a service really matters. At the moment, there is a considerable amount of diversity in the, the ways in which um, edgy roam institutions are providing a service to users in terms of the, um, the ports that they are making available to visitors. So, the problem is that <clears throat> because, because there's this lack of consistency, it makes it very difficult for institutions to know what type of applications their visitors will be able to use when they travel. And this lack of consistency makes it very difficult to support. It, it effectively, it makes life a bit easier for the, the visited institution that's offering the service because they just do whatever their local policy says, but they're shifting this cost to the home institution. Um, which, basic, which, which means that home institutions are then a bit more reluctant to participate because they're a bit concerned about the help desk costs. It also means that user satisfaction is reduced because they don't know what applications are going to work when they travel. Um, and when they travel, th these applications just mysteriously don't work. This is not a transparent network. We want to be aiming for a transparent network. The Edger and Confederation policy um, states that institutions should provide open network access. And the, 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 the spirit of this is that they really should, and they really shouldn't, unless they have a really jolly good reason not to. The problem is that the experience, certainly, that we've had in the UK is that if you tell institutions should, they'll say, oh, we'll just do whatever we want. Um, and I don't think that this is necessarily limited to the UK. My concern is that this should will be widely ignored. And even if it is only a relatively small proportion of institutions that choose to ignore this should, that proportion of institutions will probably be large enough to spoil it for everyone else. So we might rapidly end up in a situation where actually TCP80 is the only port that is widely available on Energy Roam. And so we don't have a transparent network, we just have the web. Energy Roam also has competitors. Um, we have, obviously, commercial wireless LAN, we have GPRS, we have UMTS, 3G, um, 802.16, 802.20 if they stop killing themselves. And if the, cost, if the cost to institutions of trying to support these users when they're roaming becomes more than the cost of just giving everyone a, US, uh, you know, a USB dongle for GPRS or 3G, then we might start to see usage of EduRoam starting to decline. How do we fix this? It's very contentious. It's very difficult. We have 26 NRENs, hundreds of institutions, and everyone's got their own ideas of what constitutes a sensible policy. Um, in particular, it's not clear where the policy, where these sorts of policy aspects should lie. Should it be at the institutional level? Should it be at the NREN? Or should it be at the confederation level? I think it's got to be split somehow between them all, but it's not really necessary. I don't, we haven't it's not necessarily clear what the balance is. And I think there's a good argument that perhaps we need a bit more experience, see what happens, and then change the policy if required. Personally, I carry about a GPRS and UMTS dongle. It's very convenient. Um, I go to institutions in the UK, and they have, some have edgy roam, but many don't. And if I'm on the train or at an airport, then obviously there's no, edgy, there's no edgy roam. Um, so, I think we also have to be thinking about living in a world where we, we just have to anticipate that users are going to be moving between these sorts of networks and we have to make it easy for them. Also, do we also need to think about adding further value to the network? Um, when, we were think, when we're thinking about um, Age of Rome at the moment, it's generally in terms of just providing them with a sort of a wireless ISP experience. So they just go to the internet for their access to resources. But when, when you have visitors, they often want access to sort of local network resources, like printers, like file store. 
um, local, um, local applications for uh, library catalogues and, and things like this. Do we need to think about adding more value to make EduRoam more attractive than the commercial options? So, um, in conclusion, um, most institutions can deploy EduRoam without any problems today. This wasn't meant to scare any, anyone, this talk. It was, I'm trying to elucidate what the problems are um, and how we're going to fix them. However, for most institutions, you don't have to worry about them. There are technology issues for some institutions. Um, for example, for those institutions that are having difficulty with the Windows XP supplicant, but we're very close to fixing these, for example, with Secure W2 and hopefully with the Open1x project. There are definitely significant scaling issues ahead. Um, these, <clears throat> and these will probably be fixed in the medium term. It's, they're unlikely to be fixed in the short term. RADSEC is looking very promising, and already there is some very, uh, there, we're getting good results from, from, um, from RADSEC at the moment. So, Although there are these scaling issues, it's certainly not an excuse not to join. Also, it's possible that the Confederation policy might need some adjustments in the light of experience. What we are doing is very novel, and I would not be surprised if we have to make some changes, but hopefully nothing significant. And finally, and this is sort of an open question, I'm kind of interested, do we need to think about adding more value to, Ed to EdgeRoam other than it just being a wireless ISP type service? Do we need to think about um, other types of services that, that we can run over the top of EduRoam. Thank you. Thank you for, for sharing with us your experience in Interna. Very interesting. Is there any question for yours? We have some minutes. Stefan Winter from uh, Restina, Luxembourg. I'm the work item leader for roaming, and I'd just like to add a few sentences to what Josh has already said. Um, one of the important points Josh mentioned very in the very beginning, uh, we are really pushing things with Eduro. We are going to kind of frontier, and a lot of people have to rethink what they are doing in their networks. Uh, namely, institutions have to completely rethink how they authenticate visitors, and uh, maybe even entire countries have to rethink their visitor handling. Um, there are habits that have grown in the last years, like for example using web redirect. And uh, people are used to this, it's easy to use, um, but there are some gaping security holes. And um, these are problems, well, security always comes as a, as a second step. And um, we fear that um, we have to actually go into people's minds, in admins' minds, and tell them what the problems with their solutions are before they actually see uh, the benefits of EduRoam. And uh, so the technical problems we have, um, we have mentioned these quite clearly, um, they can be easily solved. Um, but actually looking into people's heads, uh, telling them what's beyond the technology, what are your problems with the solutions you're using today, how ca your passwords can be stolen with web redirect, this is something we have to convey to admins right now um, before we can have a really consistent um, experience with EduRoam. And I hope we will get there in the, well, you said medium term. Um, we are working on all these issues you mentioned, and uh, it was really an excellent summary of what we are working on right now. And uh, I am convinced we will get uh, a solution to most of these issues real soon. Uh, about this radius competitor diameter, do you think it will be very difficult to, to write an open source implementation. It's a very difficult protocol. Or? No, I don't think so. Diameter is, is it's a more complex protocol than radius, but um, it's not a difficult protocol. There is an open, there is an open implementation that um, provides some aspects. There's something called open diameter. Um, and as far as I'm aware, in fact, the, the folks from the University of Mercia, I don't know if there are any here, can probably say more about open diameter than I can. Um, is there anyone from University of Mercia here who can? They have left. They have left today. They've left today. Oh, that's a pity. Um, but yes, there's op open diameter. 
but this isn't a complete server implementation. As far as I'm aware, it's just an implementation of some APIs for doing so. So you could, in principle, I think, build a diameter server using Open Diameter, but it's not actually a server itself. I think that's correct, but you might want to check their website. Thank you. Uh, we have some institution who don't want to join Adorum because visitors uh, use their IP addresses when connecting to the internet and uh, mainly because of incidents and, and spamming and things like that. They just want to deploy VPN solutions. So they mm. Have you had the same experience in the UK, or yeah, we how had do you deal? We, yes. How should one deal with it? Yeah, we, we, we had exactly the same experience in the UK. Um, <coughs> we we had, like you said, institutions who wanted to only permit VPN outbounds for exactly the reasons you give. We also had some institutions that didn't want to allow VPNs outbound at all, because then they couldn't inspect the visitors' traffic. So we had two mutually exclusive positions, and there's no way that you can get a consensus from that. So what we did was we went to our institutions and said, list all of the ports that you would be willing to provide to your users, and then we just picked out the sensible ones, and, and we found a consensus that way. And there are institutions who perhaps weren't happy with, with the way we did that because you know they just believe that VPN outbound is the only solution, but they're in a minority. Um, and when you're building a service, it has to be on consensus. Klaas uh, Wierga, Surfnet. First of all, thank you for your uh, kind words. You earned uh, a beer, uh, I guess. Um, Can you afford it? <laughs> it's very expensive here. <laughs> well, I'm not saying here. Eh? Um, I wanted to make uh, two comments. Um, one about the diameter uh, uh, question. Um, I also agree that diameter in itself is not uh, that complicated. The thing, however, is that the, the problems they are solving with diameter um, are now more and more moving towards the, the commercial space, mainly the mobile operators. Uh, diameter is just much better at dealing with uh, billing uh, and accounting. Um, the other problems that existed in radius are pretty much solved by the meshes you just presented so uh, in our environment I don't see an immediate need to move to diameter um, the other thing was about the IP addresses uh, we see the same in in the Netherlands and what we basically just do is we offer both options we tell them either you can get IP address space from us um, or you can use uh, your own address space and that it varies from institution to institution what they prefer. The, the disadvantage of using Surfnet's IP address space is that then they have to make sure that they route all these uh, IP subnets through their whole infrastructure and in some cases that's also quite a difficult task. Mm. Um, I, I have just have a comment. Um, I agree with the speakers before and, and, and the answers, and I also think that was a nice presentation. Um, however, I see some other problems uh, we, we have to solve um, right now, and one of uh, these problems is to getting a service operational and to care about um, the things that we need to do to monitor and to bring forward um, other service procedures. So, I mean, um, the, the protocol issues um, are hopefully not that complicated, um, mm. and I am a little bit more optimistic with the RATSEC proposal than you on your slides. <laughs> but however, I think um, to, to bring the, all, the thing forward to a st stable service is the most important thing right now. Yeah. Please uh, don't forget to fill the evaluation form. We, we really appreciate uh, your input. And have lunch, nice lunch. <laughs>